All right, we are ready for part two of the great Kino Lorber Spring Sale Grand Unveiling. Uh, I have uh, shown you 10 films I was able to acquire through this massive sale. All titles. It wasn't all of their titles. It was select titles. There was a lot of great ones. I was shocked. They were all 30 to 70% off. Uh, and like I said, they're already lower priced than uh, Arrow. So I, I'm a little crazy. I went a little crazy. I can do the uh, credit thing with Arrow and PayPal and pay them in monthly installments. I just paid the last installment on the sale that I, I documented on this channel. So, you know, that's the kind of financial position I was in then. I'm not really a whole lot better now, but a bit. And these I, I actually um, spent the money uh, to acquire my own money. And like I said, a, a rather uh, important patron of this channel uh, let me borrow some money to buy this last batch before the sale went off. Going off camera, you guys are probably ecstatic. So here's box number two, another exciting invoice or receipt. Uh, yes, I, I am paying back the patron up for this all as soon as possible. Um, he, to be honest, he may have paid for the first box and not this one, but I got both of them today and it's amazing. So I'm gonna divvy these into a bow. They divvied themselves. Very, very awesome. So this one will have a different makeup of films as far as uh, films uh, I've seen, owned, or not seen, or not owned at all. So I'm going to start with one that's been out on um, Blu-ray a very short amount of time. I'm selling my DVD on eBay. Please check out my eBay store. The information's below. I, I really could use a, a boost in that. Um, Batman Bolt with Fred the Hammer Williamson. This is a nice cover art. Uh, this is one of my favorite black exploitation films, one of my favorite action films, one of my favorite Fred Williamson films. A lot of people either don't know about it, don't care about it, or think it's cheesy and silly. Uh, so, you know, like, like here, check this guy out. He's a courier and he's got this briefcase uh, shackled to his wrist. And he's doing this high kung fu kick here against this fucker. So, excuse my nasty mouth. I'm going to curse less on the uh, upcoming version of the show. No, I'm not going to say I'm going to stop altogether. But, um, Batman Bolt, directed by Bernard Schwartz. So, yeah, uh, mostly, mostly white crew and cast. Um... You know, most of the cast, uh, well, none of the cast is listed on here <laughs> except Brad Williamson. Um, there's an interview and a trailer. But anyway, I'm just excited about seeing this on Blu-ray. Uh, I introduced a, a lot of people to this film when I when I found out about it because allegedly it was Fred hitting another action subgenre uh, put through his filter of black exploitation, um, which is a term that you know, in many interviews, he himself has grappled with over the decades as being valid, invalid, celebratory or insulting. He's kind of explored all that, his opinions about it. Um, those are great interviews. Check them out. Or on YouTube, Fred Williamson, the Hammer, interviews. Um, and that man, Bolt, he was supposed to be playing a James Bond-like character. And uh, that campaign said something like Fred Williamson is bonded, and in a way he's bonded. He's 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 handcuffed to this fucking courier case full of money and documents, and he has to get it from one place to the other. And people are trying to kill him, and he's of course just almost effortlessly kicking their ass. Uh, he takes a beating, and he he comes back, and there's several Freds on here. There's a Fred here up here with the women, of course. And then there's the Fred, that's the James Bond kind of surrogate character. And then there's Jay, here's Fred as the martial arts master. So there was supposed to be a sequel to this movie, but there wasn't. This is a brand new 4K, 2K. Oh, it's still great. 2K Master. Um, I am excited about this. I, I was I was devouring his films in the 2000s. Of course, I was already into the Larry Cohen 
uh, films, the Tommy Gibbs saga, I call it, Black Caesar, uh, and Hell Up in Harlem. Hell Up in Harlem uh, is on Keenan Lorber, and I, I have reviewed that on this channel a while back. I still don't have Black Caesar on Blu-ray, but Black Caesar. I own the soundtrack. I had the film on DVD. I had this amazing vintage poster that was worth a few hundred dollars. I think in the end, I got maybe 150 175 down from the 400 uh, fair market value. And that's fine, but it was beautiful. I always wanted to display it, but I just never had the chance. And I'm like, I'm starting an eBay store. Let's, let's part with these posters too. I haven't parted with all of them, but I parted with some incredible ones. And I don't really regret it, but you know, I still kind of, I miss them. So excitement galore. I already have, like I said, Hell in Harlem. I have Joshua. I think those are the only two films starring Fred Williamson from that golden era that I have on Blu-ray, um, that weird Blu-ray format. Uh, but now I've got Batman both. So this is the only film in this batch that is an upgrade. In other words, I've, I've already owned them on a different physical media. Okay, I'm thirsty. Before I am. So let's talk about some ones that I've seen before. But never owned. Okay, Lena Vertmuller. She was, uh, as far as I know, the most prominent female director in, in the incredible 60s, 70s, 80s era of Italian cinema that I so dearly love, as a lot of you I know do. Um, Vertmuller did some exploitation films. She did some weird comedy films. She scripted some other films that were uh, directed by other people in a bit wild like when women had tails um she was a trip <laughs> she gets the honorable compliment lena vertmuller was the trip you heard it here first this is uh the first movie because i ever seen i ever seen that i ever saw i'm pretty sure uh, my uh I, my friend michael's house he had received bootlegs uh, uh sorry um dupes of several of her films this one was the one he said really touched him and made him cry. Uh, Giancarlo Giannini was a character he said he could seriously identify with his character. And, you know, she is a female director, but her kind of alter ego surrogate character in this wave of her films was invariably a man and, and uh, almost, if not always, Giancarlo Giannini. Um, uh, the female side, which ironically or not, she didn't seem as sympathetic towards, but it depends on how you view this. Uh, was played by Mary Angela Mulatto, a gorgeous, brilliant actress, who most people only know, of my generation, really only know by her only, that I can think of, her only Hollywood film, which was playing uh, Kala in uh, Mike Hodges' Flash Gordon from 1980, which is a classic to me for many reasons, some of which are reasons that some of you guys may like it too, some of, reasons, some of them may be reasons some of you guys do not like it. Uh, but there are two layers there, three, two, three layers. There's the camp layer, which, you know, I get, and that's why most people like it. They like it. There's the, um, cinematic layer. So you're giving these Italian artisans who worked with pennies in the seventies and suddenly you're giving them all this money. Uh, you know, all, all these Italian guys worked on it. I miss a directed by a British guy, but, um, and actors from all over the world, international cast. And for for most of us, especially at that age, you know, that I was, which is pretty fucking young when it came out, uh, it was our introduction to these actors. Brian Blessed, Timothy Dalton, um, Ornella Muti, uh, Peter Wingard, uh, Mary Jo Mulatto, uh, and Max von Sydow. So I think it's important film. One day I'll actually do a review of it. It's really one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, but anyway, that's where I first saw her, and that's probably where most Americans know her. But she played some amazing roles in uh, in uh, Italian film. And, and several of them were with uh, her most lauded ones were with Lena Vertmuller. So the cast of this, I mean the cast, the uh, plot of this is kind of hard to, to, you know, so I won't, but it is it is a comedy, but it does have moments of you know, soul bearing romantic drama that that may may make me cry again. I don't know. I don't think I cried when I saw them, 
Michael was crying. Um, but I was very touched. I almost bought Seven Beauties, probably her most famous film, also with the, the with Giancarlo. Um, they had that one on the sale too. So, you know, my cart originally had a lot of films that I couldn't afford. Uh, I was lusting after, uh, and I consulted with my friend Tim McLean, who's seen all these, and we kind of talked over what we thought were the best and were interesting movies. And I just decided on a sentimental basis that I would start out my first um, Lena Vertmuller film that I, that I can think of on Blu-ray. It's going to be The Seduction of Mimi. Okay. Another film I've never owned, and it took me years to chase down and see when it finally came out in Blu-ray uh, and a DVD companion, which was remastered. Um, and uh, this one is directed by... <laughs> I don't know where they put the directing credits on here. Alain Rovac. Got back to the Alains. I'm not familiar with any of this cast outside of this film. Emmanuel Escaro. Jean-Francois Gallant and Christian Sinigay. Um, but this movie was infamous in the 90s. Uh, it's called Baby Blood. And I almost watched it with my friend The Marksman. He has had an amazing bootleg catalog of horror films. He's trying to collect all of them, all the horror films, all that ever existed on tape. And he first exposed me to, there's a lot of movies I first saw that, that either at his house with him or that I borrowed, The Beyond, I first saw through him, Cannibal Holocaust, Deadbeat at Dawn. So thanks, Marksman. Um, we never watched this one, though we almost did a few times. Uh, this is an insane film. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. A gorehound's delight, says Fangoria. This is a very intellectual and insightful recommendation there. I think this movie is a little classier than that, but not much more classy. Um... Yeah, it's uh, and the director later directed a film called Adrenaline, beautifully restored in HB, with all uncut and uncensored, with all its infamous womb rating, gore spewing, and flesh bearing, beautifully restored in HD. So, if you're curious, check this out. It's on most streaming services. I decided it was time to finally own it. Uh, here is one that I, I have seen and I discussed in the previous video immediately preceding this. This is the Fandomaz uh, serial by Louis Fouillard from the 1910s. And I was like, well, Judex still isn't on Blu-ray. Um, that other one I mentioned, no, that's by Fritz Lang. Uh, Lay Vampires is on Blu-ray, but I've never acquired it. But Fandomaz is one uh, that I never owned. Um, in, in, in any format, but I did see, uh, on, I saw on a couple of different, I didn't see it all in one sitting in one venue. I think I saw part of it on YouTube and part of it on, um, I want to say Netflix back when Netflix, you know, did, would, would deign to do films like this with their uh, screen films like this. Um, Vandermas is a, is a, a iconic pulp character. And he's a villain, unlike Judex. And uh, he's like the master villain, the mastermind. And uh, this, of course, is a spectacular restoration. To celebrate the 100th anniversary of the film's release, Gaumont, which is an incredible um, uh, film uh, company and, and, and uh, funder, producer of a lot of these films, they helped make them happen. They, they, were, they helped make... Uh, Hannibal, <laughs> the series, if possible. Uh, Gaumont and the Centre National du Cinéma, in collaboration with the Cinématique Françoise, have created a 4K restoration that is stunning in its richness and clarity. Uh, I think this entire serial is about five hours, so it's right up my alley. Uh, it's great for rewatches. And this thing has tons and tons of extras which I've never seen any of these. So, Phantom Oz. This is a key work. This is the single most expensive item I got in the sale. Not super expensive, but a few dollars more than any of the, even the most expensive of these. And none of them were particularly expensive, although I was you know, on a budget. Uh, but I was like, 
I knocked two that I had on my list out just to, to make room to get this. Okay, last one that I've never never owned, but I've seen. I saw it first run on television. Don't know how I'm going to feel about it. I'm. This is kind of a test. Uh, I'm testing myself and the film. Uh, this is uh, Rock Hudson starring in Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles. I read The Martian Chronicles, the book, uh, well before the miniseries came out on TV. And that's how fucking old I am. But, uh, you know, I was, I was extremely young when I read The Martian Chronicles. And uh, I had read some Heinlein in elementary school. So I was kind of like wanting to explore more of this classic sci-fi. Uh, and somehow... I made my way to Bradbury, and I became kind of a Bradbury nut for a while. Um, so that era ended permanently. <laughs> uh, and now later I went back and I've revisited his books or movies based on his works, kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but recently I, I had been left with a cool hardcover copy of The Martian Chronicles, and I decided to sell it. And uh, I started reading it. And it it's hardcover, a small hardcover book. And yeah, I read about the first half and I was like, wow, this is incredible. Because, you know, like a lot of his you know, novels or, or, or you know, um, they were collections of short stories that he had published in other venues like pulp magazines, sci-fi magazines. And then they had a common theme. So he would compile them into one book, which, you know, because of the weight of, of the book and the, the the uh, insane talent and, and popularity of the books, they would kind of be regarded as novels unto themselves. The Martian Chronicle is like a patchwork novel. I mean, basically, it, it's like he, uh, humans from Earth uh, finally land on Mars and begin exploring and, and find, you know, uh, the ruins of life forms that live there, but then encounter some life forms that are still living there. So... I can't recall how faithful this is to the book, but I do remember it was very interesting. Um, and it's directed by Michael Anderson, who kind of a journeyman director, but he did want, oh, he did Logan's Run. I didn't particularly like Logan's Run, the movie. I'm in the vast minority. Most people in my generation as millennials love Logan's Run, but I love the book, you know, and I knew William F. Nolan, who created Blood Logan, and I, and I knew George Clinton Johnson, who co-wrote the first one, Logan's Run of the Trilogy. Um, I read Logan's Run at a really young age. I was eight, and it was, it was fairly adult, that uh, book. I mean, you know, at that time, almost every novel you encountered had some kind of subversive graphic sex scene or, or, or you know, nasty, nasty language or you know, just frank, I, you know, frank and, you know, adult, like intelligent, uh, ideas and I kind of started craving those books at a really young age so that's part of what corrupted me into this creature you see before you this one this cast had of course Rock Hudson uh, also Bernie Casey who I adore Darren McGavin Roddy McDowell Bernadette Peters Fritz Weaver I mean come on Give it a chance. No, you don't have to. But I've wanted this since it was on Blu-ray because I'm like, okay, here it is all in one sitting. I can kind of reevaluate it. Okay. So I did buy two movies that were the cheapest ones on this sale. And they were films that I have never seen. So, but I was so intrigued by. And, you know, I know as soon as I watch them and they turn out to suck, you, you know, you're going to laugh at me. This one I bought based on the cast, which I rarely do. Just, oh, man, a star so-and-so. So it's directed by a cat named Harry Falk. I can't remember who, what else he directed. And um, it's called High Desert Kill. I remember when it came out. Played theatrically here briefly. But the star is Anthony Geary, one of my favorite actors ever, who didn't do a lot of feature films. You know, A.A.K.A. Tony Geary, who played the uh, inscrutable endlessly fascinating multi-layered character of Lucas Lorenzo, Luke Spencer on General Hospital, uh, on and off, mostly on for 37 years, and retired from that role in 2015, though he did a cameo a couple of years later. Luke Spencer is one of my favorite fictional characters of, of any medium. Uh, 
what Gary was an intellectual, uh, cultured guy. He was, he put a lot into that character and a lot of the things that went into that character have really deep roots as far as, I mean, he mined the sci-fi genre, the pulp genre, the, 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 uh, you know, kind of dark comedy, uh, rebellious and iconoclastic crime outsider or kind of, I mean, he, he mined all these little subgenres and veins, uh, you know, and then uh, of course he did have a side that was heroic and he had a side that was romantic and he had a side that was, you know, everybody's buddy, you know, he always had a intelligent quip, N not a silly quip like a Marvel movie, but an intelligent quip and all the way to the end. He just seemed to get cooler and cooler as he went into his 60s. And finally he retired, I think, at 68. So this is, film, this is a film that's kind of, um, I'm trying to remember the year here. I'm trying to see, 1989. So this is an interesting period. So, you know, I reviewed a movie, a, an early movie of his on this channel for Halloween uh, last year, I think, called Blood Sabbath. Um that's just a strange anomaly of extremely low budget 70s hippie psychedelic horror and i have a huge soft spot for it and gary is great i mean totally different than luke spencer his acting's not 100 percent on but the, the seeds are planted well um and he started on general hospital in 1978 and like i said went through that long run but there was a period where he got sick of luke spencer and he quit the show I think from 1984 to 1990. So during that period, he did score some feature film roles, and they invariably were roles that were odd, eccentric, and under the radar, you know, uh, possibly to become cult films. One of them was Peten Penitentiary 3. One of them was High Desert Kill. And also co-starring with him is Mark Singer, the beast master himself. So I have met him, too. He was... Uh, anyway... And Chuck Connors, what can you do with that? And a character named Micah Grant, who I don't know, but Micah and Mark and Tony uh, go on this hike, and from what I've gathered, some aliens start fucking with them. That seems to be the whole plot. But I was like, it's Tony and Gary, and you know, I'd already heard of the movie, I, I, you know, and I'm hoping it'll be good. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be great, but it, it's a curiosity, and occasionally. Very rarely now, because of finances, when I come upon a, a, a true curiosity that's come on Blu-ray, I'm like, yeah, I need I need it in the library. I may later sell it. You never know. And the final film in this delivery, the second box, uh, is also one I've never seen, but I've, I've read a lot about. I'm very familiar with the director, though I'm not as familiar with him as people I know, such as Robert Monell. And my dear friend Amy Green, that's uh, Valerian Borovchek. Uh, he did The Beast, which I owned that film and sold it for a good bit of money. The out of print cult epics version. Um, Immoral Tales, I've seen of his. Dr. Jekyll and Mrs. Osborne is just an absolute fucking treasure. Um, and speaking of that, uh, the star of this film is Marina Piero, who was the, the female lead in Dr. Jekyll and Mrs. Osborne. Uh, and Matthew Carrier, another you know well-regarded French actor, is in this film. Varelli and Borovacek, I guess he was an Eastern Bloc descended guy. I can't remember, but you know he worked a lot in France. Um, Ceremony d'Amour was the original name, so it was a French-made film and translates roughly as Love Rights. And here it is, Love Rights, with Marina in a chiaroscuro-like image. Uh, the plot to this one sounds wild, and I consulted some of my um, allies in, in this area, including Amy, and uh, I think I talked to Tim McLean about it, um, and I think the verdict was, of both of them was, I'm not sure if I've seen it, but it sounds great. I will if I haven't. That's cool. Um it, ca it captured my eyes in this sale. Like, oh my God, this is a Borovacek movie. There's a couple of Borovacek movies that were in the sale uh, here on Kino Lorber. And um, 
the more I read the plot uh, and I thought, wow, this is some later Varawichek than what I've seen and something I really would like to explore. It's really dirt cheap. And, you know, I love Marina Pierre. So I went for it, man. Love rice. So if this one sucks, y'all can laugh at me. It's okay. So that's box two of my deliveries. That is the entire Kino Lorber Spring Sale. 30% to 70% off all Blu-ray titles, select Blu-ray titles. And uh, this was the grand unveiling, the great unboxing. So I'm going to end this one uh, a little bit quicker than the last one, sooner than the last one, because there's less films, seven films, uh, eight, no, seven, seven in here, 11 in there. So altogether, I got 18 films. So I've got a lot to watch. And that's good, because like I said, collecting is not something I'll be able to do for a long time. It wasn't something I was able to do for a long time for most of the life of this channel. Not always. I had some surprises, you know, windfalls, money-wise. But overall, I was desperately suffering. So I did have sponsors who came in and helped out and purchased the review materials for me. You know, under the condition, of course, I reviewed them and, and, and credit them. I mean, they didn't all ask for that specifically, but I think that's how you should do it. And of course, you know, these individuals uh, include uh, wonderful people like uh, Sean Lee Levin, the great, great Tim Tolbert, who's the permanent channel patron, the, the kind of bi biggest, the biggest proponent of this channel that's helped it survive. Uh, and he will be collaborating. Okay, here's a scoop. He will be collaborating on the new expanded podcast version of this. I'm very excited. And Scoop, so will Sean Lee Levin. Well, I'll reveal the rest later. But those two guys, I, I, I immediately was like, oh, come on. I mean, they're already patrons of the channel. They need to be a part of this. And they both have a lot of interesting knowledge and things to say about film. And from, you know, an ex ex perspectives that, not, uh, that aren't your usual banal you know, cliched kind of uh, film journalism crap that I eschew, as you can tell from this channel. I don't have any, I don't want to say I don't have any skills in that area. I have worked in that field briefly, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to quote my friend Bill White, and he said, you know, it's time for some new opinions to get out there about film. And that, that he just said that to me yesterday. And um, it's so true. So that's really all I've tried to do with this channel. Uh, I've been very inspired by people like Bill. I've been very inspired by Britta Gieb, who has a, uh, a uh, Facebook group called Movies with a Stunning Message, and she had a particular mission, mission Movies with a Stunning Message. Um, the way she approaches the films and the layers and the context on all these different levels. I've told you guys this story many times before. I had this idea for a long time to do something from this approach, if I ever did a podcast. And my ex-fiance, um, early in our um, our togetherness, said, you know, we were talking about movies, so I'm at podcasts, and she said, I'd like to do this kind of movie that, uh, a kind of podcast that examine movies from these different perspectives, like psychological, philosophical, sexual, political, and, and just talk it all out, you know, and I was like, okay, we're going to do this one day, uh, Kelly. And, um, oh, I said her name. And, um, of course, like all our plans, including the studio I'm sitting at, uh, that I purchased for her uh, and me, but, you know, really it's like a love thing. But it's also a, we're building a, a, we're building something here. So that's the past. Flicker Street Studios here, and it's mine. It's a little chaotic and disorganized in a pretty messy house. But it is the so it is the source of all my Flickr Street work. It is the home for my eBay store, um, and it is the nerve center of my channel and especially Blue Review. So, thank you for watching, uh, said uh, <laughs> said broadcast, and I love you guys. I don't know when I'll be back. Due to my back, <laughs> you know, our Spider Man too. You know, my back my back and you know toby mcguire quick aside i love him because he and i have a lot in common he's short he's a cancer astrologically uh he's a vegetarian like me uh he has bad back problems so it was hard for him doing those spider-man movies on the wire stuff um 
But like me, Toby's a survivor. And he shined in No Way Home, Spider-Man. So now we're getting into the other geeky side of movies I like. Um, you know, I vowed not to do too much of that for a while because I kind of oversaturated the channel with it and got very little views. But it's a part of me. So there will be some discussion of such works uh, in the new project. It will not be the main focus, but several people I'm working with are quite, are savants like myself as far as uh, comic books and graphic novels and films and TV based upon them. So you can always look forward to that. My, my fans here, the fans, my buddies, my supporters, my viewers who are into that stuff. Some of them hate it. So I'm trying to find a, a happy medium. And I'm, I'm, I'm not good with centrism. I'm kind of a you know, radical leftist, but it's all good. You know, I, I want to speak to other people. I want to convert people uh, <laughs> to my ideas. I want to, you know, at least give them the option to espouse those ideas, whether it's political or aesthetic, artistic. Uh, and even though physically I'm at a bad, in a bad place right now, Mentally, as far as creatively, my mind is just throbbing with ideas and plans. So I yet live. I'm like Wolverine. I'm a survivor, bub. Take care of my beautiful friends. I love you.